If Amherst College taught us anything, it taught us that you could not fake it. The work we did had to be our own, based on reasonable premises, personal experiences, scientific methods, and proofs. Reflecting semblances of truth. No plagiarism, no half-baked theories or ideas, no unproven assumptions. No matter how smart you thought you were, you couldn't get away with bullshit. We could not let stand recent blog postings that included the statement, the fish rots from the head down, in reference to Zika Manuel, MD, Amherst 79, and a video featuring President Obama discussing end-of-life issues and insurance reimbursement. We can call bullshit on the edited version, taking Obama's remarks out of context and manipulating the message. After watching the full video, we can return to the topic at hand and parse out the truth as opposed to the deceptive manipulations presenting a false narrative by untruthful editing. Unfortunately, this crap fools a large segment of our population. It's surprising that this includes Amherst graduates. Uh, she's 105 now, over 105, but at 100, uh, the doctor had said to her, uh, I can't do anything more unless you have a pacemaker. Um, I said go for it, she said go for it, but the arrhythmia specialist said, um, no, it's too old. Um, her doctor said, I'm going to make an appointment because a picture is worth a thousand words. And when the other arrhythmia specialist saw her, saw her joy of life and so on, he said, I'm going for it. So that was over five years ago. My question to you is, um, uh, outside the medical criteria uh, for prolonging life for somebody who is uh, old, elderly, um, is there any consideration that can be given for um, a certain spirit, a certain uh, joy of living, um, oh, uh, um, quality of life, uh, or is it just um, a medical cutoff at a certain age? And we're not going to solve every difficult problem in terms of end-of-life end care. A lot of that is going to have to be we as a culture and as a society starting to make better decisions within our own families and, and uh, for ourselves. But what we can do is make sure that at least some of the waste that exists in the system that's not making anybody's mom better, uh, that is loading up on additional tests or additional drugs that the evidence shows is not necessarily going to improve care, that at least we can let doctors know and your mom know that, you know what, maybe this isn't going to help. Maybe you're better off uh, not having the surgery but taking uh, the painkiller. Jane Sturm, your mother, Hazel, yes. Hazel Homer. Yes. 100 years old, and she wanted? Uh, she's 105 now, over 105. But at 100, uh, the doctor had said to her, uh, I can't do anything more unless you have a pacemaker. Um, I said, go for it. She said, go for it. But the arrhythmia specialist said, um, no, it's too old. Um, her doctor said, I'm going to make an appointment because a picture is worth a 1,000 words. And when the other arrhythmia specialist saw her, saw her joy of life and so on, he said, I'm going for it. So that was over five years ago. My question to you is, um, uh, outside the medical criteria uh, for prolonging life for somebody who is uh, elderly, um, is there any consideration that can be given for um, a certain spirit, a certain uh, joy of living, um, oh, uh, uh, quality of life, uh, or is it just um, a medical cutoff at a certain age? Well, first of all, I want to meet your mom. <laughs> and I want to find out what she's eating. Uh, but, uh, look, uh, the first thing for all of us to understand is that uh, we actually have some, uh, some choices to make about how we want to uh, deal with our own end-of-life care. Uh, and that's uh, one of the things I think that we can all promote, and this is not a, a big government program, this is something that each of us individually can do, is to uh, draft and sign a living will so that we're very clear with our doctors about how we want to approach uh, the end of life. Uh, I don't think that we can make judgments based on people's spirit. 
uh, that'd be uh, a pretty subjective decision to be making. Uh, I think uh, we, I think we have to have rules that uh, say that we are going to provide good quality care for all people. But the money may not have been there for her pacemaker or for your right. grandmother's hip replacement. Well, and, and that's absolutely true. And, and end of life care is one of the most difficult sets of decisions that we're going to have to make. I don't want bureaucracies making those decisions, but understand that those decisions are already being made in one way or another. If they're not being made under Medicare and Medicaid, they're being made by private insurers. We don't always make those decisions explicitly. We often make those decisions by just letting people run out of money or making the deductible so high or the out-of-pocket expenses so onerous that they just can't uh, afford the care. And all we're suggesting, and we're not going to solve every difficult problem in terms of end-of-life end of care. A lot of that is going to have to be we as a culture and as a society starting to make better decisions within our own families and, and uh, for ourselves. But what we can do is make sure that at least some of the waste that exists in the system that's not making anybody's mom better, uh, that is loading up on additional tests or additional drugs that the evidence shows is not necessarily going to improve care, that at least we can let doctors know and your mom know that, you know what, maybe this isn't going to help. Maybe you're better off uh, not having the surgery but taking uh, the painkiller. And, and those kinds of decisions between doctors and patients and making sure that our incentives are not preventing those good decisions uh, and that the, the doctors and hospitals all are aligned for patient care, that's something we can achieve. The unedited version is a clear and articulate statement about the challenges facing families, patients, and doctors as they deal with aging and end-of-life issues. Obama discusses how we are going to pay for services to the elderly and how that enters into the difficult decisions of care versus rationing care. Private insurance companies have honed rationing to a fine edge. Medicare has improved end-of-life options for the elderly. The edited version leads one to believe that Obama is suggesting that Hazel Homer might have been better off taking painkillers than having a pacemaker implanted to deal with her quality of life issues. That is false. Obama is not specifically talking about Hazel Homer at this point, but about end-of-life scenarios frequently involving hospice and pain control issues in terminally ill patients and patients with advanced dementia. Obama states, and those kind of decisions between doctors and patients and making sure that our incentives are not preventing those good decisions and that doctors and hospitals all are aligned for patients care that's something we can achieve hazel homer got her pacemaker and medicare paid for it doctors have the ability to pre-authorize medications and procedures that may be initially denied not only by medicare but by private insurance companies as well Hazel Homer's case is 180 degrees different than a 100-year-old patient with terminal pancreatic cancer. Obama directly addresses this end-of-life issue. And, and end-of-life care is one of the most difficult sets of decisions that we're going to have to make. I don't want bureaucracies making those decisions, but understand that those decisions are already being made in one way or another. If they're not being made under Medicare and Medicaid, they're being made by private insurers. As Obama says, he does not want bureaucracies making end-of-life decisions. Death panels described by Sarah Palin during the 2008 presidential campaign do not exist. Physicians in primary care who have cared for patients at the end of their lives would testify that Medicare does not interfere with proper treatment for our geriatric population. Private insurance companies are infamous for their denial of treatments of both the young and the old. If we can stop the deception and rhetoric of the last four years, perhaps we can look forward to a period of rational compromise and problem solving. That should draw us together as a nation. And let's go back to our roots of English 1-2 and relegate certain blog entries to the bull shit sheet.